Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 476. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Wheeler, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, the Duke of You Know, and the elder statesman of the podcast. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we're going to be talking about Detective Comics. We're going to be talking about Trinity. We're going to be talking about two most recent issues of Superman. We're also going to be talking about the brand new series, Doom Patrol. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network, the League of Comic Book Podcasts, and the InfiniteComics.com Podcast Partnership. Longtime listeners of the show will know that Jim and I are big fans of the movie Hero Tomorrow, but also of the comic that spun out of it, Apama. Apama's issues 6 to 11 are now being collected in another Kickstarter. And the cool part about this is they're offering both the soft cover and the hard cover signed. The hard cover will also be numbered. If you haven't checked out Apama before, this is a great opportunity to also, through the Kickstarter, get Volume 1. So be sure to check out Apama, the Kickstarter. Links will be in the show notes, so highly recommend checking out Apama. Sponsoring us once again is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, it's that time of the month. It's time for them to switch over and give us the brand new deals that are coming for October. So be sure to jump over to the site and see the amazing discounts. I do want to remind you they are a digital partner. Whether you do MyDigitalComics.com or Comixology, be sure to link those accounts to your DCB Service account and get 5% towards your DCB Service order. Jim over at InStockTrades.com. They've always got their deals of the week. And they've got Batman Beyond Trade Paperback Volume 2, 50% off, only $7.49. They have Green Lantern Hardcover Volume 8, Reflections, 50% off, only $12.49. Superman Hardcover Volume 2, Return to Glory, 50% off, only $14.99. Superman Trade Paperback Volume 1, Before True, the 50, is 50% off, only $8.49. We've got the Wonder Woman celebrating 75 years. This hardcover is 50% off, only $19.99. Do you get those celebration hardcovers? There's been a number of them that came out. Lex Luthor was a recent one. Did you grab that one? (laughs) The seventy, any of those celebration seventy five years, I'm jumping on those, and when they're, you know, it's either I'm getting them through in stock or I'm getting them through DCBS. You know, yeah, I'm jumping on those things. I love those. Yeah, so it's a celebration of seventy five years, and what they do is they they go throughout the history of the character and take select issues, and that are kind of landmark issues, and 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 represent an era. And it's really neat to read them if whether you've read the era. You know, you're one of those fans, or you're a newer fan, you're like, you know what, I've never really read this character historically. It's fun to see how the character has changed over time, and they're really well put together books. It's great to be a part of these 75 years anniversaries. My buddy buddy told me that um, uh, USPS is putting out a Wonder Woman stamp. Series and in, in, uh, celebration of the seventy-five years. So I'm glad to see that it's happened now for Superman. It's happened for Batman, and now for Wonder Woman, um, a, st- a stamp set, and that's going to be kind of cool. So I don't know. I'm all excited about that. But I want to thank InStockTrades.com. They're your collected edition source. Whether you like trade paperbacks, hardcovers, absolute editions, um, omnibuses. You can get them over at uh, InStockTrades.com at just amazing discounts. It's a great way to get caught up on on books that you wanted to read and to get them in these nice collected formats. So I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Mr. Segulin, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets! It's a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth and do plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better... Enjoy the show. I don't know what all that just was, so let's talk some comics. <laughs> that was my Doom Patrol. <laughs> Nothing like the handy dandy electro claw for carving through metal doors. So, Jim, this is a book you and I were talking about, as we'd always do, what books we're going to talk about on the podcast. And I you know, started rattling off a list of some titles that I thought would be good ones, and we were kind of chatting about the pros and cons of why talking about them. Then at the end, in passing of this conversation, I talked about this book, Detective Comics 940, which really does need to be the kickoff to our discussion for many, many reasons. So do you want to kick off with the creative team on this one? Well, uh, script by James Tinian IV, uh, pencils by Eddie Barrows, inks by Eber Fiera, with colors by Adriano Lucas, 
uh, letters are Marilyn uh, Patrizio, P-A-T-R-I-Z-I-O, Barrows, Fiera, and Lucas on the covers, with uh, Dave uh, Wheel, Wheel goes uh, as assistant editor, Chris Conroy editor, Mark Doyle group editor. Batman was, of course, created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger. The cover. I, you know, it's funny looking at the cover now. I didn't notice on the cover that Tim was missing. I mean, I noticed the cover. I noticed them, you know, downtrodden. Um, I noticed. I don't know why I didn't notice that because I guess you had the body of the, you know, the fall in one of one of their people, and I didn't put two and two together. Then, you know, I noticed the inside cover. And it was like a great Tim piece and all that. And I, I, I guess I hadn't really registered what this story was going to be about. My second read through, the cover took on a very different tone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's funny because we when we had our conversation. I hadn't read this, and you did. And I'm like, have you read Detective Thomas? I'm like, I don't know if I have. He goes, the fact that you're hesitating tells me you did not read it. And I'll tell you, man, as soon as I started reading this, I was cursing up a storm at you going, Sean, if he dies, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, man. I'm going to. I was blaming you, by the way, for all of this. And, you know, just because I knew there was something monumental would have to happen. And the last issue ends with Tim just basically pulling all the uh, drones at him. And I it, it was funny because it completely slipped my mind that that's how the last issue ended until I started reading this. And I go, oh, yeah, he's got that army of drones attacking him. Oh, Norge, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. And it just as I'm reading through it, you're see, I'm just seeing the progression of the terror and the horror. I'm like, oh, God, no. And I, and I loved how... You know, Batman reaches out to this is Batman to all allies. And it was funny because when I read that moment, I was like, Superman, that's how it's going to happen. Superman's going to save the day. This is going to be the beginning of the Batman Superman friendship because he's going to fly in to save the day for Robin. That's how this has got to go. Please let this out. This has got to go. That's how the hell. And I kept throughout as I'm reading this, trying to find a different way for Tim to survive. <laughs> The, the line was really telling, too, because it's Red Robin is engaged in a mortally dangerous fight at Old Wayne Tower. I need someone, anyone who can get there to help him. Nobody falls today. That's an order. The desperation that's there, which isn't yeah. something you're used to normally with Batman. And I thought that was really cool how they crafted that piece, because there was a sense right away in the main pages kicking off the sense of urgency. I wasn't. I guess I've been so focused on this team, and th that's what this book's been about, the team, Batman and his amazing friends, you know, uh, that it really was it was kind of bringing Clayface as this cool, interesting character, um, not reimagining Batwoman, but, you know, bringing Batwoman back into the fold, because she's a character they've been really trying to do something cool with, and she's an interesting character. But most importantly, Cassandra Cain, Tim Drake, and Stephanie Brown. This book really has, since the beginning, been bringing them back to where they were in the previous universe before everything that they did with Flashpoint. So, it, you know, this really was that book that was that linchpin for that. So I guess I really didn't see this coming because <laughs> I'm like this. The whole point of this is the focus on these characters and getting them back to the core of who they are. I didn't see what was coming with Red Robin. And I loved how they played this because I'm like, oh, man, they're, they're really you know, showcasing why Tim is absolutely the coolest Robin and having him do all these amazing things that you and I have always loved about the character. Like this whole issue from start to finish. And it kicked off, sure, last issue, like you mentioned, when he pulled everything on himself. But from start to finish, this whole issue felt like beat by beat. It was the Tim Drake we were reading before Flashpoint happened. And it, it's funny how I've it really enjoyed the development of the new 52 Red Robin and what they've done with the character. But when you see this issue, there's something different happening here. <laughs> it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> and and it, this really did a very good job of putting me in that place of, oh, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. And it's I tell you, and it's funny because you have these great Tim moments, but you can't lose or forget the powerful, you know, Batwoman versus her father. 
Mm-hmm. You know, that those sequences, because, again, this was something that was building up throughout the past issues when we first had the concept of, is her dad the bait bad on this? Or is he actually? And then you had that whole moral dilemma going back and forth. Is he really the bad guy? Is he really, you know, is this what's right? What needs to be done? You know, is this one of those kind of, you know, villains who's not really a villain, but who is a villain? And I love how that was playing out. And especially this mo- these moments where she's finally like, that's it. You're t- I'm taking you down. There is no, you know, excuses, no explanation. You know, that's it. You're the bad guy and you're getting beaten. And I love how she had just, she made the resolve. She made the call and that was it. It was locked in full on. This is not going to, you know, this is not going to end well for you. And even loved how the dad had his escape plan all set. They were going to teleport out. But what she do? knocks him out the window, knocks him out of the building before he can get out. So she took him down. The rest of the group got away, but he did not. I love the fact that she was willing she was willing and able to take him down. That was one of those kind of moments where I was wondering if this how how many issues this was going to drag out. Was he going to get away? Was this thing No, she beat him. She got him. And it's kind of a cool moment to see that yeah, she did that. Then it goes from that cool moment to the horrific moments. Well, and you got to believe, here's the thing, one of the things with her, she's a character that's been really well developed, and has been developed as a character who really has some history to her. You know, she's she's been this military girl, she's had proper training, uh, you, you know, you, and you've got to believe that she really is supposed to be the partner of Batman on this one. Batman's looking at her as really the lead general of his team. And Red Robin is this, like the first lieutenant who reports to her. So you, you, you look at that kind of military hierarchy to how this team's been developed. you got to believe that about the character. And if you don't have moments like this, you don't believe that about the character. I've really loved how when the squad arrives on the scene at any point in time, she's driving the ship and yeah. really implementing different moves, issuing orders that show that they have a team dynamic. I love that they're learning new things about Clayface. And learning how to expand and extend Clayface's abilities in the way that he's a useful field agent now. I <laughs> I never thought of like sitting here like going, man, Clayface is really cool. But Clayface is really cool. <laughs> they made Clayface really cool. I love oh I love God. how they've they've done this. Yeah, and it, Clayface was always one of those guys that you know, when they did the right story with him, you felt bad for the guy. Sure. Because here he was, was this great actor who, because of some freak accident, could no longer be an actor. Could no longer do the thing that he loved more than anything. He had to give up that life and he became the monster. And it's one of those, you know, kind of, yeah, he became a monster on the outside. So then he started just lashing out and started becoming the monster in reality. And is he really a bad guy? And we're seeing here his chance at redemption. We're seeing that there really is a decent person in there, you know, or maybe there isn't. I don't know. And that's, that's the thing I like about this right now. Clayface has been a decent, cool guy, but you know, if the moment came, will he do the turn? Will he not? I don't know. And I think that for me is the exciting thing about the character that, yeah, right now he's a good guy, but he could very easily turn. And if you tell the, tell it in the right story, it, you can understand it, and I think it would it wouldn't take too much to actually have a correct story for him to show his turn. I agree with you. That would be that's something that's really important is to make sure that you have the right story to show his turn. And he is a character that you can easily see being you know a good guy for a certain amount of time, going bad guy again, um, just because of the nature of what you talked about. Um, there is a mental and emotional piece to him. I love that they used that here, but they did something different with it, a different twist in turning him into a good guy. I think we've seen him go down this path before where he's connected with people because of that vulnerability. But I like that now Batman's really given him a chance to be himself again, to reclaim his life and to really help him. And Basil bought into it. And I think as being a part of this team, you get to see more of that. I, I really love that part of this whole thing. This book really does a great job of humanizing the characters while at the same time providing some of the most amazing action I'm reading each month. Um, this is a very action-packed book. And I think it is the squad tactics that do that. It's also the way that they handle Cassandra Kane is phenomenal. This is a character who I've really loved. And I know we, I, I ask you this probably every time we talk about her. You 
had like a very mixed exposure to her. You don't know her, I think, to the same level, right? I mean, you don't right. know this version of her. How are you digging this ex? Because this to me is verbatim. If you, if I was going to sum up what I loved about Cassandra Cain, it's how this book's writing her. Is she a character that you feel an attachment to now in a way? And I know you love the name Orphan and that type of stuff. Do you find an attachment to this character now? With big time, handling? big time. I absolutely love this character. Love, you know, she's one of the characters I will fight and defend for. Yeah. Because, you know, it, again, you know, this is my Cassandra. This is how she is. And this is everything that's playing out. This is her. You know, what everyone knows her as Batgirl, for me, she's Orphan. For me, this is the character. This is her birth. This is her origin story. And just how she's playing out here is absolutely wonderful. This is, I am so, you know, deeply just connected and just absolutely love this character. And I'm so happy that I'm getting this. Because I know everybody who talks about her as Batgirl say, oh, it's a great run. She's an awesome character. And yeah, she is. I'm seeing that right here. And part of me wants to go back and get the old issues and find her as Batgirl and read some of those stuff because and for as excited as I am about this, I know I'll be equally excited as that for the old stuff as well because from everything I've read, from everything you've said, from everything I've heard online and whatnot, it's this is the characterization. This is what makes her so cool. So it's I want to read the other stories as well about her. Did you read No Man's Land? Yes, but it's been so long that I barely remember it, to be honest with you. Yeah, because that was the introduction of her. And then it spun out to her becoming Batgirl. Yeah. And so it's it's interesting to see the character done like this. You know, back to this book, um, I'm, I'm looking at the page right now where, you know, Tim is really in dire straits. <laughs> and Batman's like, Tim, get down into the Belfry now. I loved the sense of urgency. You know, Batman, I mentioned it before, but that was something this book did really well. You're right. They were they were transversing between the scenes with uh, with Catwoman. I mean, Catwoman, Batwoman <laughs> and her father to these scenes. And I really love the sense that Batman's rushing to get to him. Batman's trying to get anyone to him. Batman's trying to do anything he can at this point. Batman's really well aware because I mean, Batman's a tactician, right? He knows mm-hmm. how bad this is. And he's not letting himself admit it. He's not letting himself give in because he doesn't do that. He tries to make the impossible possible. So he's running and racing against time, trying to get to him, trying to get Tim safe, giving him advice. What can he do to get because he needs Tim to buy time so he can get there because he knows if he can get there, he'll do something. What he's going to do, I don't know, but he's Batman, right? Just right. Gotta, he's just got to get there. <laughs> then it'll just be Batman and do the Batman thing, and it'll all work out. I loved that this is what this was setting up to look like, and it didn't go that way. Oh, God. And one of my favorite uh, scenes in comic books ever is the scene where Tim's dad dies. Yes. In, um you know, an identity crisis. And it's not my favorite scene because he dies or even how he dies. It's the moments leading up to it. And it always, every time I talk about it, I always get a little choked up and always catches me in the throat because just thinking about how when his dad's on the mic and he's saying, Tim, it's not your fault. I'm proud of you. Everything you've done, all the people you've helped, you know, it's not your fault. And I, I still remember just I mean, the first time I read that, because you get this this father who's desperately wants to make sure his son knows, one, that he's proud of him, two, that he loves him, and at three, it's not his fault. His death is not his fault because right. he doesn't want his son to carry that burden. And I love that scene. And this scene right here is also same type of touching moments because you got the panic in one man who's never panic, and that's in Bruce. And just that fi- those final moments of Tim, he's like, Bruce. Tell them I'm sorry. Tell them how much they meant. They all meant to me. Dick, Jason, Damien, Alfred, all of them. Thank you for everything, Bruce. Robin out. That right there, I'm like, man. Especially because he says Robin out. Not Red Robin out. He says Robin out. It was one of those things where Mm -hmm. he never claimed the title of Robin because Jason was dead and it was the way they explained it. But right there, he's a Robin. And he, you know, and and I'm trying to get emotional. And it's funny because, you know, he's not actually dead, but it's still, just still, this. These sequences, you know, just tug at the heartstrings, and then you go over to Steph, right from one page to yes. another, you know, where you're just like, oh my God. He's like, you know, Steph, can you hear me? Listen, these last few months have been incredible. You helped me discover exactly what I want to do with my life, the kind of man I want to be. I was going to be there for you. I love you, Steph. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> 
And just I'm like, again, and then, okay, okay. And he just has that moment of calm where he's like, okay, it's time for me to die now. You know, and I'm just like, dang it. You flip the page and you get that, just that dramatic scene of Tim just getting cut down. And I tell you, first time I saw this, I screamed, no! And I was pissed. And I was like, oh my God, how can they kill him off? And you go, and it was just one of those things that you went through this total roller coaster of emotion, you know, and it was just like so powerful of a story being told that I was like, oh my God. Oh, I absolutely loved, loved these scenes. Yes. And, and the, the, Batman arriving on the scene again, it reminded me of Death of the Family. Um, just. Des, you know, again, that desperation that, that Bruce feels to in those moments. He's sitting there holding his staff, and it was just woof, an iconic, iconic moment. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce, in that moment where um, she's like, "We can turn him over to Argus. I know they'll want someone to answer uh, for his actions. No, take him to the Belfry, to the holding cells. Bruce, he'll answer for what he's done. He'll answer to me. I." I <laughs> <laughs> You're not, there's oof, there's no messing with him in that moment. My favorite sequence, though, is this next one where they say later, yeah. and you see spoiler, and Bruce goes there, and you see the softer side of him. In the you don't see that very often when he's in the cowl. Um, he usually you know has to take off the cowl in order for those sequences to happen. I liked in this, it didn't matter. It you you really see Bruce Wayne standing there, and that's something that's interesting when an artist is able to convey that. I think. You know, you can convey the character underneath because sometimes you have to take off the mask to convey emotion. They do a really good job of doing that. When Bruce is like, you know, he chose his life. He'll always be remembered for his contributions. And she shows him the letter about being accepted to Ivy University, uh, University for that sequence. And Bruce realizes he was walking away from this. Like his plan was for something else. He had other plans, other dreams. And now those dreams have been snuffed out. And the hand shaking, I thought was just to me when the letter drops and you see his hands shaking there in those moments. That's something that's really great about Batman because he's always so dark and brooding and emotionless. When they do show emotion with him, he's such an interesting character. Yeah. And, oh God, yeah. And that the, the a picture with him hugging Stephanie in that moment, the two of them just sharing their grief, was just like it really. That's a poster. I mean, which I don't usually like grim posters. I usually like you know more you know badass action oriented ones and this was one where I'm like no this one really should be a poster it's just great artwork and really conveys two characters um, going through an emotional moment then all of a sudden pop there's Tim (laughs) I was like like, oh man I did not see this coming and there were a lot of spoilers on the internet about this one when I say spoilers I mean people you know were talking about it obviously as they would I had no idea this would be connected to the whole Watchmen thing that's going on so I, so the question becomes, the guy who's saying this to him, because he's basically saying, you're so beloved, you're reconnecting things that shouldn't be reconnected. And he was. He was bringing back certain elements of the DC universe that haven't been there in a while. I love the way they've taken this story now and said, these really are your characters that you were reading in the past. Something's been done to them. And Tim was starting to be one of those players that reconnects them. You're not going to be alone. There's somebody. There's other people that are going to reconnect him. Here's the question. Who else are they going to kidnap along the way? Because this is the first of many. They're going to eventually go too far, and somebody's okay. going to figure it out. And I can't wait to see how that's going to happen. I did not see this connecting to the larger story. They completely swerved me on this one. I absolutely love that they chose Tim because they so nailed him in this story. To take him on this one adds just a further piece to this whole thing. Yeah, and I, again, with you, I was like completely just elated that he was still alive. And I hooped and hollered. And again, it was one of the neat things. I loved how that, you know, again, like you, I was completely swerved, didn't see it coming. I was, st- you know, up until the point when Tim gets cut down, I was holding on to the fact that Superman was going to save the day. I actually I was I was hoping that's how they were going to connect the you know Clark and Bruce together and all that kind of you know just that moment but you know this to me is a much better ending you know because one 
it further connects it to the big mystery, but I love Tim being the badass that he was. You know, stop playing games. You obviously know who I am. I was trained by the greatest detective in the world. You won't keep me in a cell forever. Let me go now or you'll regret it. Right there. I was like, yeah, I want to see this one. I want to see this play out. Oh, man. There's there was so many just hoorah moments in this. So many cool Batman moments. So many cool Tim moments. So many cool just life moments in this. I absolutely love this issue. I- Everything about it was perfect. It was just really terrific writing. This book, it's weird. I don't want to say it's a sleeper hit because that's kind of a strange thing to say. But I'm I'm thrilled and through the roof with what's going on in Batman. I love what's going on with All-Star Batman. Great titles right now. But this Detective Comics book, I think because it kind of, in its billing, when you take a look at it, it looks like the secondary title. You know, out of, out of the three, it looks like the one that, you know, would be kind of in the other Batman book. I love that it's not. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I really love that it's not. I love that this book really has meat and bite to it, and there's there's something to be said for what's going on in this title. Really good stuff. Oh, God, yeah. And, again, art as well as story for me. Yes. You know, and I know it is for you as well. This was a beautiful book, some great art moments, some, some of those iconic emotional moments that pulled it out of me wasn't just the story being told. It was the image. Like you, how you said, with the, I loved, and I'm glad you pointed out the hand shaking. And that was a perfect, perfect touch. And showing just the pure, just, this, you know, um, you know the, the, the sorrow. Any, but even beyond sorrow in Bruce's face that was the look of a man who just had his heart broken and it was one of the and i love how they were able to capture that with him still in the cowl that just oh man uh, artwork story wise everything detective is just hitting it on all cylinders for me i'm very very happy with it can we talk trinity oh please jim let's for our next talk let's talk about trinity number one and this is by Francis Manipul on the script, art, and cover. Steve Wands on letters. Jason Fabach and Brad Anderson on the variant cover. Paul Kaminsky is the associate editor. Eddie Berganz is the group editor. Superman created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by special arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family. Batman, of course, created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger. And Wonder Woman created by William Moulton Marston. And apologies for any name butchery. This is a great book, and what I'm loving about this, first issue out of the gate, I didn't know what to expect from this one. You know, I figured it was going to be another action team-up book, right? They do one of those, and um, you get to see these characters team up together, and you, and you get some bits of character development and interaction and dynamic, but you don't get a ton of that because that's usually done in the other books. I did not expect this one to kind of go the uh, Batman and Robin and the current Superman route. And I'm glad that it did. I really like that this kicked off with the fact that this is a different Superman. This is not the Superman that Wonder Woman and Batman have been hanging out with since the beginning of the New 52. This is our previous Superman from before Flashpoint, who's back now. He's got a wife. He's got a kid. Um, This guy has got a rich history we know of. They don't. They don't necessarily trust him. They want to get to know more about this guy. What makes him tick? You know, should they trust him? What's the reality? I think Diana feels one thing as far as trust goes, where Bruce feels another sort of skepticism. (laughs) And I like that this book embraces that, explores it, but does it by the fact that they come over for a family dinner at the Kent's or at the, uh, what? um, Smith. Smith's, yes. Um, I keep thinking the Kent's because they are the Kent's in all reality. They are the Kent's, but... Their cover name is Smith. I like that. <laughs> I really do. And I like how this this all played out. Um, so it was really great to see them over there. I like that Clark wasn't aware of it. This is something Lois put together. It shows that strength of Lois. And I really like that about the character when they showcase that, like, she realized, hey, this needs to happen. And just because they're superheroes and it's, you know, these big icons like Batman and Wonder Woman doesn't mean that I don't have a role in this and I don't have an active voice that will help with this whole thing. And she does. And I, I think that was just really cool how this all played out very well written um for a first issue was this what you expected from this book what were you what were you looking for out of this i I, like you i was thinking you know it'd be an action physical team up i was not expecting this kind of especially i didn't i wasn't expecting this opening you know but i love absolutely love it because again this shows why 
you know, Clark, you know, Clark is with Lois. You know, the fact that she is smart enough and strong enough opinion to actually pull this off and not, you know, you know, she knows the three of them need to get together. The three of them need to get to know each other. They need to interact and not just when they're saving the world, but the personal time. She yeah. recognizes that, you know, Lois, you know, that Clark, Diana and Bruce had a friendship outside of the hero stuff. And in this universe, this Clark needs to have this. And I love the fact that she took, you know, the initiative to invite them. And I love the fact that when Diane is invited for dinner, she shows up with a wild boar, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's the thing to do. You know, you're invited for dinner, so you bring dinner and you bring this massive wild boar. And I absolutely love the fact that that's the opening scene with her carrying it and that it, people keep coming on it throughout the whole thing. Is that a boar? And, why is there a boar on my front porch? I love just how it kept you know, getting brought up. And I'm hoping next issue we're going to see them actually roasting the pig or doing something else with it, that this wasn't a one-shot. Francis Manipul, I loved his artwork since Top Cow. Um, a lot of his work over there was where I first got to get to know him as an artist. And when I was really excited when he came over to D.C. because I really enjoyed the artwork. And I love when you see an artist grow. And they start kicking it up a notch. And everything that you loved about the artist originally is still there, but they've taken it to a whole new level. That happened with this artist for me. And I really have enjoyed seeing how he tells stories like this. Like the the opening sequence with this whole bit. You know, when you become a parent, a lot of people are going to give you their advice, whether you want it or not. Then there's the unsaid competition between other parents and the development of their kids. Mine is only four months old and she's already crawling. God, I hate that. Well, my son can lift cars over his head. Can you top that? I just what a great sequence of events, especially when you realize who's narrating this whole thing. Yeah. And you know, then it leads to that great page with Diana, and you see what's going on there, where she's bringing that over there. Um, you know, you better not be late, Bruce. And you see the great sequence with Bruce heading over there. Um, again, D- uh, Lois taking us through this story as the narrator, I thought was really a great way to introduce this, and I really enjoyed her perspective because it. It puts Superman kind of on equal footing with the other two as he's a character in the story she's telling right now. And it it added more meaning when you got to see them in the kitchen. You know, John and, and Lois kind of sitting there and, and having I just really great. And I tell you, the the sequence, that Batman sequence when he's first arriving, that for me is just I want that as a poster. I want that whole image. Yes. And I absolutely because when you first my first read through, you you see the bat. You know, because he's broad and up front, up thing. And you kind of start seeing some of the bats. You see the bat jet in the back. You kind of see the glisten on the one panel. But then when you really start diving into the artwork, you start looking at the backdrop. You start looking at just how the the the, the sun is turning the, the the farm fields, you know, into like kind of that golden hue to them, and you're just like, wow. And it just the way that it's. Pencils, inking, coloring, everything that played out on this one page was something that, you know, you could spend just, you know, just you can spend a while just staring at it going, dang, that's cool. That looks awesome. Especially, I loved how in the three kind of broken up panels of the jet, you know, you got the bat plane arriving, Bruce jumping out of the plane. Then the last kind of mini panel sort of, you're seeing it streak away. So, you know, Bruce arrived and it went on autopilot to go somewhere else and not just hover in the area, but kind of went, um, you know, went covert or went stealth or, or left the area. I liked how the fact that they, you know, he added just made sure that little bit of glimmer so you know it's leaving. It was like, it's something you didn't need to do, but it was kind of a little extra touch that, I, again, I noticed it like, you know, during the art read through. I was like, oh, that's cool. I liked her uh, rationale about Superman kind of putting up walls, um, naturally protect himself. He was raised that way because parents had to be careful because of how people would potentially view him, what it would mean, things like that. He was he was raised to have a secret identity to protect himself. I like how she referenced, though, but here's the thing. When he took down his wall, look what happened for us and how it made things better. And this is another opportunity to take down the walls for the right reason to bond with these two and to make life better. What worked before might not or will not necessarily work here because this world's very different. And I like how there's this, it adds a sense of time passage. The new 52 is representative of today's world, right? 
So they've moved the DC Universe forward. I like now that with this step back that they've taken to say, let's get these characters back to the core of who they are, including let's, let's, put a, let's drop a Superman in here from a different era. It, it really has added a sense of them kind of analyzing our world today. And that's what these characters should do. I mean, DC's characters, when you think about it, um, Marvel, what, one of the cool things about Marvel characters has always been that they're very street level, right? They're very much in our world. They're very current. DC's characters are, are kind of outside of it. They always are like these larger than life icons. That's not taking away anything away from either universe. I think as I'm a fan of both universes and I like them for their unique natures. You always reference with Superman, the dun da da you know, that's kind of the <laughs> thing that stands up for you. Um, I don't think there's not a Marvel character that gives you the dun da da. Spider Man's like the yay cool guy you can hang out with. You know what I mean? And, and there's something to that distinction and duality between the characters that I like. I like that the flagship characters kind of have that different thing about them. Captain America is, I guess, their closest um, icon on that end. And the thing that I like about Cap is. Cap is grounded in, in a certain sense of real world. Yeah, there's a super soldier serum and all that, but Captain really Captain America really is a soldier, you know, which feels more real. I mean, there adds the reality to him. I don't. There's something to I think the separation. If I'm making any sense at all, the DC characters have always been more kind of up on a different pedestal, um, whereas the the Marvel characters are more rooted in that reality. And I like seeing the world through the eyes of the DC characters. There's something interesting to that. Um, it makes both lines, I think, interesting to read when they embrace who they really are. Yeah, you know, yeah. When you, it's funny because when you can look at these superhuman beings and say that's very realistic. That's you know, mm-hmm. and that's for me has always been a great storytelling. You know, that's always been a great story. Like with this, we've got a kid who shoots uh, eye beams out of his, you know, laser vision, blasts a, the Amazonian god of war and a guy who dressed in the back costume. And you see just how the parents react to it. And you see how the kid later on is like, I'm sorry I blasted you, Mr. Wayne. I hope my dad's shirt fits you. My dad's uh, shirt fits you okay. You kind of can see this little kid actually reacting and dealing with it. And it's funny because within the confines of this crazy universe, there's very realistic moments. There's very true moments that a husband and wife would have a conversation as, why'd you invite them over? Hey, it's time. Relax. Take this in. Smile. You know? And I love just how, again, regular, everyday human interaction that these superhuman beings are having. Yeah, and I guess that's a piece where I think DC, I'm going to correct myself a little bit, if there's one thing that I, de- I think DC's done well in evolving is learning how to have those human moments with their characters in the right timing while not losing that special thing that I was talking about earlier. I think there is an interesting balance there. I think it's why when Marvel came on the scene, why did it get so much popularity? Because of the fact that they, they really did do this realistic thing that you're seeing right here so well. And they they continue to do that with their characters. I think DC eventually found this great balance of being able to do this with their iconic characters. And with all their characters, I should say. And when it's done well and you don't lose what makes DC characters special, it really works. And this is a great example of that. So I'm going to correct myself a little bit in what I was saying there. Because you're right. I love these moments where they are... (laughs) But they're really grounded in reality. Um, and there's these larger-than-life characters. You see them brought down to Earth. And that part's really cool. I do like that Clark, when you see the sequence, Clark looks like he's out of time. You, you know, like, you could almost put this sequence in black and white, and <laughs> it would be like an episode of Leave it to Beaver, um, except Beaver's shooting eye beams. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I kind of like that quaint kind of sense of the, when they go to the countryside and, and they're at their home, they really do transport themselves back to an older time. Yet both of them, Lois and Clark, can be argued as being very contemporary because they're so in tune with the media. You know, they really rely on current media and what what's happening in the news and staying up to date in order to for both of themselves to function. You know, Lois's key job and, and Clark's way of gathering information are both tied heavily into that. So it's interesting how they're able to skirt that line and still maintain values. I think there's a certain sense of values that comes from Superman. And I guess that is where they're kind of linked. He's kind of linked to Captain... Well, (laughs) it's traditionally has been linked to Captain America. (laughs) 
current uh, current stories have have made that kind of interesting. But um, <laughs> which uh, are you still reading Captain America? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I couldn't. I am not able to put that down. <laughs> Just because I gotta see how this. Goes yeah, out, <laughs> yeah, they, they got they got me on that one, but it's certainly a, there's certainly a distinction. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm taking a little sidestep there. But um, I don't know. I really loved the whole dinner dynamic. It's funny how you can take a whole book, and your action sequences are really only in flashback, where Clark's sharing stories of Rainbow Batman, who I, I want to say isn't this Batman, but then. What happened to Detective Comics is making me question if it isn't really this Batman. <laughs> I'm gonna say this isn't that Batman. That's his. Ba- that's Clark's Batman. I don't think he ever did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, One, it is an old. It is the old Robin costume, which this universe Robin never wore. No, you're misunderstanding me. This universe was done to them. Are these those people? And something was done to them. Remember what yeah. we know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something keep, I, was done to them. So I guess when I look at what happened to Detective Comics, I'm looking at the guy Clark's sitting off across the table with and the conversation he's having there where Bruce is saying he doesn't remember. That's legit. He has no recollection of that. But here's the thing. I'm not entirely convinced that's not Bruce Wayne, the guy who's in the rainbow outfit. I'm thinking these people have been messed with. I think that's where this storyline's going. I... I think the Detective Comics storyline has convinced me more than anything that that's what happened. I think the connecting threads are putting back... Now, whether or not they're going to gain back their full memory and everything, I don't know. But I think Wally West returning, everything that's happening here... Remember, Wally West that came back? That's the same Wally. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Barry knew him. So isn't that's got to be then the same Barry Allen. Yes, oh, yeah, it's the same Bruce. I'm just... You know what I mean? Yeah. This this stuff is like mine. It actually changes when you read these stories, and you see those pieces as they're being told. And I don't know. I'm I'm loving that part of this whole thing. Their dinner conversation with Lois and Wonder Woman, especially with the fact that there's that unspoken thing between them. Wonder Woman was having a major relationship with the New Fifty Two Superman to the point where they were in love and everything like that. She sees these two holding hands. This guy looks identical to him. I like that that's having an effect on her. And then I like that the two of them address it. I love the conversation between them. And there was something great about that whole thing. This for an issue to be so much revolving around calm conversation. It's one of my favorite issues I've read <laughs> in a yeah. while of a book. What a great kickoff. It's proof that you do not have to be throwing kitchen sinks at people in order for a book to be really well written and entertaining this book does a great job of character development yeah and it's funny because again the inner dialogue that's going on the narrator narration Mm -hmm. you know that we know is now lois telling the story i thought was absolutely and i loved just the ending where it's you know great things start small sons grew up to be fathers from strangers to brothers Rivals to sisters. I love just how that played out with showing Bruce and Clark, you know, kind of having a moment, you know, kind of having, and then showing Diana and Lois having their moment. And I love the fact that this is really the birth of the Trinity. This is the birth of these three getting together and understanding each other and actually something beyond that. And this is, the, it's, it's weird because... I was thinking it would be more of a physical, you know, the uh, kind of a classic team up book. I wasn't expecting, uh, you know, the personal growth in it for some reason. But I'm so glad we're getting that. I'm so glad we're getting that development of these three together because, one, the thing you said about how these are the same universes. And because remember, this Bruce Wayne. He knows about the that they've been messed with. Yeah. He knows because Barry came to him to explain to him what was going on because Bruce is the great detective. So Bruce is, you know, maybe this is going to be part of adding to the pieces of the puzzle, pulling these, you know, this is this, you know, comics going to start pulling into those, you know, the, the memories and bringing everybody back in the fold. It's I'm, I'm excited because there's going to be so many interconnections going on with this massive big story. It's going to get told through multiple different titles. It's going to get affected by different people. And I think this has the potential to be one of those uh, titles that has some big developments in it. Yeah. That, that part for me is uh, particularly interesting because 
Uh, here, here's a sequence I love. I'm just looking at this one. I, I, I know we've we got a larger discussion to have with this, but I'm, I'm looking at this sequence. Sons grow up to be fathers. You were talking about that. You see Clark sitting on the bed. Good night, John. Bruce saying this. When they sleep, they seem so innocent. You almost believe they would listen to what we say. And on that one, he's talking about Damien. He's talking about yeah. Tim. He's talking about Dick Grayson. He's talking about Jason Todd. This is a guy who's been a, a father or a surrogate father multiple times over. And I like that they're connecting over that. That's part of the great thing with history. <laughs> but there's a different part when Clark's putting his hands on their shoulders. And, and you see Diana, you know, uh, just got, you know, sort of going along with it. But Bruce kind of giving him a scowl. <laughs> so great. The personality in the artwork of this was really awesome. The mystery when they go to the barn. I mean, this really, when you think about it, there's been very little action going on in this story. When they go to the barn and you see Clark seeing an image with his dad and himself looking back at the barn and just kind of like, whoa, uh, I can't wait to see where this story is going to go. I love Jonathan Kent. Uh, If we get a story that at least has some reference back to Clark's childhood, I'm all for it. Or at least here's the question. Is that which Clark is that? Well, that's I'm assuming that's him. I would think so too. It's a, either a ghost image or some it's those magic beans that some that John got from somebody, that mysterious stranger who is giving them away. <laughs> that's who did this. That's what created this. Now whether it's these are just remnants from it, you know, it I don't know. It's part of me is thinking these are remnants inside somebody's mind that are coming out. And it's just that kind of, you know, that, that fantasy that comes to life, you know, and, or some weirdo mystical kind of whatnot. And it's, again, I love how throughout this whole thing, you kind of see bits and pieces of those, the, the greenery growing. Yeah. You know, first is the early in the they they show you know Jonathan just planting the seeds, and they show a little bit of spark of growth, a little bit more growth, a little bit more, and then finally at the end where you see the greenery spread everywhere, and you get the phantasm, the phantom images and whatnot. It's I, it was one of those things where you're sitting there so engrossed into this development of these three that you figured, oh yeah, they got another story going on. Yes. And that part's really cool that they have um, another story going on. And there's that whole – I like that there's different layers to this story here. And, and I want to see more of it. I'd actually like to see – For I'm loving seeing Lois and John in here. I'd love to see um, some of the other Robins, um, Alfred. I'd love to see Diana's world brought into this. It'd be great to see you know, them – because it's always fun when you see like Batman and Superman looking at Wonder Woman's world. Superman and Wonder Woman looking at Batman's world, right? You kind of get to see those worlds from a different lens. And I do feel like you're riding along. Sometimes you're riding along with the two people that are, are, you know, kind of looking at it objectively. Other times you're riding along with the character that you normally follow because you're in the know, (laughs) you know? And that part's always kind of fun, too. This book is a surprise for me. I I really found it very charming. Um, And... It's funny, when you say that word, that's another diminishing word, right? It's kind of like you're being pretentious when you're saying that. I don't mean it that way. It's really charming in the sense that that word's supposed to be meant to. It was just such a nice, refreshing read. The artwork was gorgeous. It, I, I read through that story four times. And, and the reason why I did it is just, it was a great issue. I did the art read-throughs. You know how you and I always talk about we like to go back through and just kind of really enjoy the art and all that. But then, just for the heck of it, uh, before we were going to record, um, last night I ended up reading it again. And I just went through and just really enjoyed the experience. I really enjoyed the artwork of Francis Manipal. And I just loved how this all went together. I I don't know if he's going to be doing the artwork on every single issue. Uh, I really, if they got, there's got to be a guest artist, great. I think his writing is really good on this one. He really understands what to do with these characters and the kind of storytelling that I want. I'm glad that it wasn't what I expected. I'm glad it wasn't the typical team-up story that you get when you put characters like this together where it's like, you know, they either start fighting each other, then they team up and they start fighting a big bad, or a big bad draws them together and they fight and we learn a little about along the way. I'm not against those stories. I quite enjoy them. But 
I like it even more that in this particular case, it was not at all what I expected. I like the surprise. Yeah, oh, definitely. Speaking of character development, can we talk? Uh, we're kind of lightning around this one. Can we talk about Superman six and seven? And Please? I'm saying I'm saying six because six is the issue. I'm just going to jump right to it. Crypto, crypto. Yeah. I did like this story was about um, Superman's Kryptonian heritage, right? And this is again not the Superman from. Uh, this is not the Superman we've been seeing in the New Fifty Two. It's our traditional Superman. He's come back. There's a new Eradicator, and he's trying to wipe out John to purify the Kryptonian race and to bring back the Kryptonian race. So he's trying to do everything he can to salvage that. Uh, Superman's fighting against that, you know, obviously to protect his son and his wife and everything like that. But besides that, he's connected with the Kryptonians. And we get to see this great moment where the Kryptonians give him the wink and the nod. They believe in him and and you know, they want to stand by him and, and what he's going for. I loved in the moment, I did not see this coming. He calls for crypto. And <laughs> it's not the crypto that we've seen in the New 52, the one that looks more like a wolf. It's the old classic crypto. I don't know, mind blown. I don't know how they're pulling this one off. But, man, I was so glad to see that dog. I was so glad he took the eradicator's cave and threw it right on him. <laughs> like, like, Let's get back down to business, boy. I I just loved it because it's such a Superman story that, like, you're like, huh. So which crypto is that? That That is, I mean, that's the old school crypto. Does that even make sense? I don't know, but it works because it's Superman. And I like that they're just having fun in this book. This book is fun. I like the family interactions in this book. I like that the stories are light, but with depth. You know, a lot, light sometimes when you say that, it's kind of like, oh, this story doesn't have a lot of depth to it. This does. There's a lot of char- character development and depth. But to me, bringing crypto back in, I'm sure there's a logical reason why that makes sense. I don't know that I care what it was. I just thought it was cool. <laughs> and, and sometimes it's fun to just like like something because it was cool. Crypto bites his arm, Superman's arm. He yanks him out, and then Crypto's in the fight. I'm yeah. like, yes, let's do more of that. Are there other people in there that can bite Superman's arm and be pulled out? I don't know. But this magic hat that's inside the Eradicator was a lot of fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely loved this issue. I loved six and seven and uh, Peter J. Tomasi's story with Pat, uh-huh. well, Peter J. Tomasi and Patrick Gleason's story. Pencils, Patrick Gleason, inker, Mick Gray, colorist, John Cl- Callitz, um, letter, Rob Lay, Doug Monkey, and Will Quintana on covers. Kenneth uh, Rocafort on varying cover, assistant editor, Andrew Marino, editor, editor Eddie Berganza, and, of course, Superman, created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by Special Arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family. Had, had to throw out creative team just because of, one, the story has been a wonderful. The artwork has been absolutely fabulous. You know, when he pulled out the old school crypto, I noticed that it wasn't the still wolf. I didn't care because, you know what, I love that crypto. <laughs> I was like, you know what, it's crypto. He's pulling them out. Now, in my head, the way I explained it was the fact that you think about it, crypto was a was the physical energy inside the eradicator. So when this version of Clark pulled him out, it would have been this version of Clark's crypto that you know he would have been able to focus on and that energy and that's who pulled him out. So that's why it's it's the crypto that this Clark dealt with not the last clark dealt with right right exactly okay yeah i don't care um i'm i'm happy for any explanation of this it just worked for me it really just worked for me Uh, there's this book does exactly what tomas and gleason have been known for they did this in green lantern when they were working on part of the green lantern team and the green lantern court books um they did it when they were working on batman and robin they've done it here now it's when these two are together there's just a great energy it's they understand the right kind of storytelling it's conveyed in the words it's conveyed in the art um the book always winds up being a sleeper hit for me and why i say it's it's almost like wrong to call it a sleeper hit because this to me is one of dc's top tier premier teams um these are the ones that dc really and they clearly are because they're putting them on flagship books constantly together or independently of each other it, it doesn't matter how they're doing it. These guys 
just really get great storytelling. There has not been a bad issue in the titles that I referenced just now. I mean, it's just ba-bam, ba-bam, ba-bam. Great story after great story. It's consistent every month. I, there's always moments where I'm like, that may be one of the best issues I've read all year. They have ways of delivering that repeatedly. You know, we referenced many times the movie night story in Batman and Robin, right? I mean, it's being yeah. an issue that stands out. Uh, that still stands out to me to this day of being just one of the cooler stories that I've read. They deliver moments like that constantly. Uh, I love seeing Lois in the Batman armor, John, both of them fighting together. This is a family. You know, a lot of times there's that, that kind of thought of... Um, Lois somehow being diminished when she's not handled right in stories. I love that they reference the fact that she's human, but that, like, she'll get innovative. And when there's an opportunity to do something to protect her family or her husband, she will get involved and do it in a way that makes sense. It's She's not in there punching people like, you know, she's Superman or anything like that. She's really acting as a defense agent. And, and a voice of reason many times, especially with her son. I like that the two of them are, are kind of watching from the outside what's going on with Superman. I feel like I'm riding with them. Yeah. Like when, I, when I'm reading these, this particular issue, I really feel like I'm hanging with Lois and John and seeing what they're seeing. And my favorite geek out moment besides crypto being pulled out was, first of all, the part where he says sit. But then that iconic at the end where he's up on the moon. Superman is here to stay. He's standing there. I believe the outfit. The outfit works. That new outfit. Because in that moment, it just it looks so iconic. Like you could another thing you could put in a black and white lens and go, wow, that really works. It it feels like George Reeves. Big time. And it's funny because as you're talking, I'm just nodding yes, yes, yes. Agreeing with you completely on just the explanation, just the the emotional that I'm getting from the Superman title. Mm -hmm. Because this is, you know, fun, cool, enjoyment. It's There's so many different, you know, this. I love the family dynamic that we're getting. And I love every time they show John, he always has this, yeah! kind of mindset in the middle of these fights in the middle of the craziness he's like yeah my dad's superman yeah and i love just how he's just a kid he, you know he's so into the moments and especially some of those those times when he probably should have been scared but he wasn't because one is dad superman two he's fighting you know this alien on the moon and his mom's in a giant bat costume how awesome is that i love just you go from those moments of comedic to those again you know the deep meaningful moments of you know where you know you know, Clark's pulling out crypto, but especially love that moment when the eradicator is talking about the legacy of the house of L belongs to John. Boom. Yes. No more eradicator. That for me was another cool hoorah moment. You and you flip the page and then you get that great iconic scene where, you know, the, the, the last energies of the Kryptonians are there giving their blessing and then they just disperse in peace. And it's one of those, again, really cool go in peace, brothers and sisters, until we meet again. I, I, it was just some really cool just Superman moments. I like that the... Um it's kind of contemporary with the Eradicator trying to purge impurities and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we're, we're in an era where, you know, talking about tolerance has become much more prevalent nowadays. And I like how comics sometimes deliver a message, you know, about just be kind. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's something to Superman about, like, Superman just wears that like a badge, right? He's just a good guy. And I think when you tell interesting stories with him, you get behind that. That's the trick with him is to, to keep the stories interesting, to keep him somebody that's relatable and current, but yet there's got to be something classic to him that like nobody can live up to. Superman should be that big brother guy that you look up to and go, I just can't, I'll never be him. I can't be him. Big Brother's probably not even the right word for it. He is he is like this heroic icon that you look up to. Because um, Dick Grayson's kind of the consummate Big Brother. Superman really is more this guy you look up to and go, man, uh, I'll, I'll deal with it. Like he, If he waves at me or even acknowledges that he saw me, I'm like, that is like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> He's that kind of guy. Because uh, I, I love that when he was on the big screen, everyone's like, it's really him. Whoa, cool. Yay, soups. He's inspirational in those moments. 
And that's something, no matter what area you're in, people need inspiration. They need those inspiring icons. And I love that this this book kind of embraces that and really shows why people would believe in him. I love the flying around the moon together. It's, you know, you see him with, with crypto. And John talking about with his mom how someday he wants to grow up to be just like dad. And she kind of goes to him, no, you kind of want to grow up to be the best you. And I love that message too, right? Because we all like struggle from hiding in the shadow of our parents or older siblings or whatever. And I think that's kind of a, a hard thing is to try and figure out who you are and to embrace that and just kind of be the best you. And I, lo- I love that about that. I, like, I felt like I was like, wow, this is like pretty instructional here. It's like therapy. <laughs> reading <laughs> Superman. <laughs> felt really good after reading this issue. Like everything was real bright and cheery. So, dude's being given the key to a city. Bibbo likes him again. You know, I mean, Bibbo like is now the, the, the team super. I like how they put that back in place. You almost got, you got to put Bibbo back in place almost immediately, right? Yeah, and it was, I was glad how when they first brought in him back into the story, he was like, hey, that ain't Superman, is it? I don't know, you know, because he was always a big Superman guy, but now he's like, no, that's Superman, he's back, you know. And I, I again, like you, I'm like, hurrah, I'd be, I'd be right along with him if, you know, if we lived in the world that actually had that Superman, I'd have the big red S on the shirt. I'd be that idiot who's like, yeah, Superman, it's my guy, because you know, it's, you you know, with us in wrestling, you know, you think about how, you know, there's certain wrestlers who have this iconic status, who have like, you know, Hogan, you know, The Rock is another one, Austin. These guys who have these, this, this presence where if I know, you know, me, if I was in a room and in came, you know, in walked Hulk Hogan, I'd be like, uh, I wouldn't be able to speak because it's the Hulkster. I have that same type of mindset where if I was in, you know, if I lived in this comic book universe and Superman walked in the room, I'd be like, you're Superman. You know, it'd be one of those, I'd be so tongue-tied, I wouldn't be able to speak, and I'd be like, ah, you know? I like that part, though, because yeah. he th- adds a reality to the character, right? Um, and a, an iconic reality to it. I love that he afterwards took Superboy to the Watchtower after teaching him about a secret identity and introduced him finally to... Batman and Wonder Woman. This is a nice transition because this is a family that really has been hiding in the shadows for a long time, for the entirety of the New Fifty Two. Uh, what the the what six years time frame, however you want to call it, they've been hiding out yeah. and watching this world. Superman's been stepping in and helping out, but he's been doing it more ninja like in the background. Now he's you know I'm back. I'm I'm being me again. I, I'm embracing who I am again. It's almost like a part of him that was lost has come back in. And I don't know. I'm just really loving the whole premise of this really is a rebirth of Superman. I can't wait to see what happens with Batman and Wonder Woman because of it. It, it feels this really does feel like it was great to read this and then go read Trinity because these books feel like they're very connected. The characterizations in them are very linked um, there's some great editorial going on. I don't know if the writers are working together or sharing ideas. Whatever's working out I think is just really great. Yeah, you can see the story going from this one to Trinity. Yes. You know, this is the introduction of Superboy to, you know, introduction of John to, you know, Batman and Wonder Woman. You can see it going from here, you know, from this to, you know, developing on. But the one of the things I absolutely loved was when he's talking about developing the secret identity. He's like, the best part about putting on gla- on the glasses is what happens when you take them off. And I love just that scene where they show him taking off the glasses. Because that for me was a really cool just Superman kind of dun, 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 dun moment. Yes, absolutely. Let's go talk about issue seven, seeing as we're jumping in there. Because we've got the family going to an, an event together. And this is supposed to be one of those events where... Like, Clark was taking some time off and spending time with his family. But it did kick off with this amazing sequence where it's like, he really is back in action. He's looking down at the Earth. He's helping out Aquaman. He's helping out Flash, Wonder Woman. They're all saying thanks until he gets to Batman. And Batman's like, when it comes to me, start asking. (laughs) (laughs) I just, I love those moments. Seeing him sitting on top of the Daily Planet and watching over Jimmy Olsen and everything that's going on. it's, it's, It's like you finally settled into, I just moved recently. So I'm settling into a new home, right? I've got great neighbors. I really like where I live now. 
I, it's starting to feel like home. And I, so I'm, I'm so connecting with this issue because you got Superman settling into this different world. Even though it's Metropolis, sure, it's not his Metropolis. It's not the one where he was. This is a brand new universe for him. Or, well, we got our own assumptions on what's really going on here. But regardless, <laughs> for him, under his current assumptions, this really is a brand new world that he's adjusting to. And I love just, like, he's enjoying it. Like, sitting there on the Daily Planet building, smiling and looking and saying, I got all this accomplished today. Then going home and having a great night, you know, with his wife and, like, planning planning this family outing together. And she's so skeptical about him. Like, he's saying, no, su- you, really? No, Superman? I know you too well. You're going to go do it. He's like, no, I promise. I'm like, he's like, I'll even give you my cape. And I love her. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the natural moments of this where she knows who he is at his core and something is going to happen that is going to draw him out, and he's still going to go do Superman things. I loved seeing them go to the carnival. Jonathan's running into that girl that knows him. It's such a great cast of characters. This book is incredibly well written for that part. I do like that. I like the supporting cast. I like that um, there's neighbors that Clark is worried about knowing the secret. But now he's trying to loosen up, relax, because he also doesn't want them to wonder why he's being so suspicious. So I love that sequence because he doesn't want them finding about his son. He he's acting like his dad right now because he wants to make sure that nobody discovers Jonathan and that Jonathan can have that life wearing glasses where he can be a normal kid and, and have friends and, and have a chance to develop. Because for Clark, that was really the key for him. It was the chance to make friends along the way and to be become this well rounded kid that grew up to be a well rounded adult. And I like how that's something that's really important to him, that he keeps grounded in what it's like to be a human from start to finish. It's not always being on the outside and being this hero. It's about being able to sit down and have those simpler times, those quieter times, and appreciating them. I think there's something important about that now, because we are constantly on the go. And we have this immediate access through texting and email and all that. Yeah, I'm a tech guy. I love tech. But... There's a point where sometimes you sit down together and talk. There's a point where you sit down to read a book. There's a point where you do some things that are unplugged just to round yourself off. And I think you appreciate those other things later on. And I think this message comes through in this title in the way that it's handled. Oh, big time. This was one of those really great stories. Again, it's a cool character development, a cool moment of kind of rest. Yeah, where it's, I don't want to say the calm before the storm, but there is, you know, you know, there's going to be some big boom, 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 because we had that with the Eradicator story. We had some big heavy hits. So this issue to follow up that massive Eradicator sort of just, you know, Lois Clark, you know, and John just hanging out at the county fair, but Clark still being Clark. He's still got to, you know, save the day when someone's going to rob the the place. And I loved how it was kind of a throwback to the old coming up with a cheesy excuse to get away where he's like, oh, yeah, my uh, lactose intolerance is kicking up. Hold on a second. And he leaves and does the Superman thing and then comes back and joins him for the uh, roller coaster ride. And it was kind of a neat, you know, just again, a, a neat fun. And you you say that without it being insulting. You say that with because this should be neat. This should be fun. You should have a moments where you get this great family dynamic because again, you have people who are doing superhuman things, but they still have a very realistic reaction. When Lois realizes that Clark actually did use the powers and did yes. have a, a Superman moment, I knew it! You, know, you see her calling her out, but Clark and John are way up having fun on the roller coaster. These these are two people who can fly, but they're still streaking and having fun on this roller coaster. I'm like, man, that's awesome! It was one of those kind of really cool, just... You know, Superman, Clark Kent moments. And Wait, I love that. Best line, John John Smith, or whatever you want to call him, up, up, and away. That <laughs> was fantastic. I love those. And it, here's the part what was great about that sequence. It, it wasn't afraid to be fun. You know, you mentioned fun over and over again. I like to smile. I like to have a good time in those sequences. I thought there was a great action. Like, the mystery of going on of the thieves, and we really shouldn't gloss over that. The thieves were ready to rip this place off. Clark overheard it and went out of his way to foil them. And I loved how that whole sequence played out because 
He did it in such a way that he didn't ignore his family, was still present and a part of the whole thing, but we were kind of in on that, look what he's doing. (laughs) Yeah, go soups. Um, That part was really, really great. And framed up in those moments, I grew up as a kid reading, you know, uh, Superman's best pal, Jimmy Olsen, and uh, the Lois Lane book. And I I got a lot of those things at flea markets, you know, when you would get those ones where Superboy is a kid and, and those type of things. They were beat up nicked up. A lot of times I never saw the front cover or every single page, but I loved reading those things and paging through them. And they had a lot of stories like this that were grounded in reality. They weren't always these big adventures where Superman was off, you know, defending the planet from aliens from outer space. Some of them were Superman dealing with day-to-day events, you know, and, and common thieves and, and things like that. And I loved that this kind of harkened back to that whole thing. And, and his interactions with the supporting cast, because you want to flesh out the people of this farm. that They bought a farm. I want to see who the neighbors are in that interaction. This is, you know, the small town America kind of thing. This yeah, has always yeah. been a key part of Superman, and it's an important part. Especially because they're now getting jobs with the small local newspaper. Yes. They're now starting to, they're they're inter, again they're interacting with their community and they're, they're starting to, you know, develop outside of just their own little world. It's they're expanding out, and I want to see that expansion. I want to see the dun 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 Superman moments, but for me, it's always been those out of the costume moments that really drew me in and really made me just love this character and especially you have the great lois clark relationship add jonathan into it this is something that is like man this is a you know again this is a great superman story action comics is an awesome superman story this is a great it's like each one has their kind of their part of the universe that is superman they're telling you know for me this is the family team dynamic and i hope this continues having that same type of family team dynamic story going on because that is something that is absolutely just hitting it on all cylinders and Speaking of hitting it all in all cylinders, you got to give credit. Different art team on this one than on the last one. Jorge Jimenez and Alejandro Sanchez on the colors. You know, you got to give full credit for them on their visually creating, you know, what they created. Because, again, as much as I was loving the other, the past, um, you know, stories with, you know, that creative team, this creative team came in. This was, I don't know if they're a one shot or if they're continuing on or what, what the deal is. But this was a beautiful book, and it was one of those things that you didn't skip a beat because it still looks, feels, story, everything feels the same as it's going on. So absolutely, I'm, I'm so in love with Superman right now. This has been a, an absolute joy of a title. You know what's great about this? With Rebirth, they made these titles biweekly. And to your point, they had to shift um, art teams in this particular issue. Great choice on the art team because you're right. They were delivering a home run, too. And I think that's something, if they can keep doing this, I don't care about shifting our teams. I really don't, as long as you've got quality ones. And we've got quality art teams on this book. Got the same storytellers, so they're delivering the same consistent story and the quality that we're expecting. This wasn't a fill-in issue. It was a different art team that was delivering a story from the main creative team. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, it, I love that dynamic of this whole thing. The bi-weekly delivery today is really working for me. And not every title has to do it, but I like that their core titles are doing it. The You mentioned before about how this book's different in the da-da-da sense than the, <laughs> than the action <laughs> comics book. It's a little strange saying that. But um, it, I like that we get action comics one week, then you get this title. Action comics another week, then you get this title. They're delivering different kinds of storytelling, and I feel like you get a well-rounded Superman experience. And I am so Superman happy right now in a way that I haven't been in years. It's really, really good stuff. Jim, our next discussion is going to be of Doom Patrol number one. This is part of the Young Animals line. The first title actually kicking this off. Happy Birthday, Casey Brink. And it's written by Gerard Way. Art by Nick Darrington. Tamara Bonvillain is the colorist. Todd Klein letterer. Nick Darrington main cover. James Harvey main color cover main cover colorist <laughs> brian boland and sanford green on the variant covers jamie hernandez babs tar brian chippendale also on the variant covers molly mayhan the associate editor shelly bond is the editor adam egypt mortimer special thanks and doom patrol created by arnold drake 
this was a book, I honestly, because of everything that was going on with Rebirth, I forgot this line was coming out. I was really excited for it because it's, it's a line that's outside of the main DC line. And they're trying to do something different with some of these properties that fall outside of your traditional DC Comics characters. I'm a fan of when they launch things like this because you want to round out your comic book line and you want to take some of the characters that are quirky, that are a little different, but are creative. And Doom Patrol is certainly one of those things that fits in there. I didn't know, I got to be honest with you with this one, I really enjoyed it the first time through. If you had asked me what happened, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> and then I read it the second time through. I'm like, oh, okay, now I'm understanding what's going on here. It's just a wacky story. And I, I'm really loving it for that. It embraces its being odd. I like the characters, and I think they did a smart thing in the beginning by really focusing on Casey so we get to know this character because you got to give us something to attach on to. And I think for me, why did I really like this from the get-go? I like her. And I like her friend. I like what's being done there. Uh, obviously, they're going to be part of the Doom Patrol. You know, she's going to be part of the Doom Patrol for sure. So I'm like, okay, I'm all in. That's kind of cool. I'm liking her. If I'm going to be riding along in this story with her, we're good. They needed to do that in this first issue because it's odd. <laughs> and, and, and that was the part that um, really kept me going on this one. I'm in for issue two because I like her. I want to see what's going on with Niles Calder. I thought what they did with Robot Man in this one was particularly interesting because they're having this kind of existential discussion. The two of them are standing around talking about, well, and what if this burrito was like a micro-universe and that type of thing? <laughs> well, it turns out that it was, and Robot Man <laughs> was in fact in it, and it exploded in a garbage can. So, I mean, it's not something you expect when people are having this like it's two friends that were having this deep existential conversation that led to nonsense that you would expect was nonsense not reality the nonsense became reality robot man came out of an exploding burrito i'm just saying he came yeah. out of an exploding burrito that was awesome you want to sell me on a title put robot man in an exploding burrito stick it in your title where i least expect it and i'm on board for issue number two that's what it took to hook me on this book i'm in now that's my take on this one this one was one it was i really wanted to talk to you about because we sometimes have different tastes and i didn't know how you would feel about this book i'm really very curious to see if you had the same experience because exploding burrito robot man did that what did this book hook you are you in for issue two did was this too odd for you where were you at on this one you know i i personally do not do not do not advocate the usage of drugs however i think if i was high i'd probably understand this a little bit better man this was a serious trip and i'm trying to figure out <laughs> what the hell just happened what did i just read and you know i got done with this going Okay, now, going into this, I knew it was going to be a little bit on the freaky side, because that's Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol does things a little bit different. I, I'm remembering the first time I read you know, Doom Patrol, and I remember putting it down going, Sean, I, I'm going to kill you. What the heck did I just read? You know, And again, after multiple read-throughs, I kind of started getting the groove, and then a couple of other times I'd read some more Doom Patrol, and I started understanding. Well, I understand, but I'm using air quotes around the word understand because I, I don't still to this day don't completely understand all the quirkiness and the the weirdness that is Doom Patrol. Now, I'm definitely in for issue, I'm definitely in for issue two because I got to see what happens. <laughs> I, 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 you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I'm not saying I absolutely love it. I'm like, oh, my God, this is great. No, but it, it was just so out there that. I have to see what happens. I have to, I honestly have to find out, do they find Danny the Brick? Do they find, does Robot Man come back together again? Where is, what's going on with Niles? I, I'm hoping that Samson doesn't explode when her new roommate sings to him. I want to know who she is. Why did that one guy explode? Why did her old roommate explode <laughs> and to turn into what looks like... She Chase was okay Man? with it. She was okay with it. <laughs> and everybody was okay with this. So like, wait a minute. But even when, you know, and I don't know if that was just an art choice to make it less gory, but to me, that looks like cake batter. Did she turn him into cake because she was wishing him happy birthday? <laughs> 
Because that's how I read it. Because you see the splatches and all that. I'm like, wait a minute. Or is that or is that the gore? I, I can't tell because this is suicide. Uh, excuse me, Doom Patrol. This is a super freaky story. But again, I'll tell you, I was laughing my head off throughout all this, especially now. We're, when I first read her little song, I did sing along with. Well, the first time I'm reading it, then the second time, oh, I gotta read through this. I gotta sing along with her. Yeah, and I'm singing and I'm dancing and boom. <laughs> I was like, what the heck is going on here? You know, it's, it, yeah, there's so many just, oh, my God, this is absolutely bizarre. And I want to know if that cat is somebody, if that cat is going to be something special or something weird and crazy, or if that's just a normal cat. Anything in this book can turn to be into, <laughs> turn into something freaky. And I think that's something I want to know about. <laughs> I loved it. I honestly did the like I read it through the first time. I'll say this: the first time I read it through, I really liked it. The second time I read it through, I loved it. And I'm still in the same place though, like you are. And and I totally appreciate where you're coming from on this one because it's odd. And I was like reading it them through, like I literally went through. And I'm gonna still say right now, I've read it twice now. I haven't read a chance to read it a third time. I want to. I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> And I, I'm finding that charming because it's Doom Patrol. And, and you said it before. It's quirky. It's weird. I like the characters. you got to really sell me on liking the characters to follow along with something like this. And I am because the characters are likable. I liked Casey. I liked her friend Sam right from the get-go. They're hanging out, playing a video game, having the kind of conversations we'd have. I remember we used to stay up like late at night in high school. All of us, we'd be hanging out over at Bill's house or something, and we'd talk about like the craziest stuff, like we were mad scientists or something. Mm-hmm. You know where you were? I mean, you'd, like, you'd get on topics like whether it's politics or um, history or current events or whatever, and uh, or even just religion and you have like these deep respectful conversations but like you would throw out your own like philosophical ideas like you know we're like the brain or something like that <laughs> and, and we would literally talk for hours about that it's one of the things i've really enjoyed i think over the years about our group of friends is we do hang out with an interesting group of people and everyone's got their own little unique thing about them, their own unique background, and they bring something unique to the table. So when you have those conversations, they're throwing in that thing that like you wouldn't have thought of, but it it's you want to riff off it because you're interested in taking the conversation further. This read like that to me. Very strange. Because <laughs> yes. the burrito conversation was the part where I'm like, I could see us having that conversation, right? You get on a tangent and you start talking about, well, you know, we could all be just a smaller part of this other thing. Or what if this other thing next to us is a whole universe just waiting to happen? Well, it did happen. <laughs> and out of it came this robot man. She takes the robot man back to her apartment. I like that we haven't really wrapped our head yet in what's going on with robot man or Niles Calder. They teased it. And they teased it in a way where they gave us just enough that you're intrigued. It's wacky, it's weird, and, and you're right, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I think you're supposed to be in this place. It's I don't think you're feeling anything that's unusual. I think this book is supposed to have that kind of thing to it. And I think you're supposed to be at the end of the issue going, was there enough here that I really am curious? <laughs> and and they did, their, by the fact that you're saying there still is, I was curious if you were going to say to me, Listen, dude, I'm just going to read this for the show and just be honest. Because you've done that before on the podcast and been very honest about it. Uh, I was thinking, like, this is either going to be one of those or there's going to be just enough to pull you in and and go on this one. <laughs> and I, I'm with you on the exploding. I didn't know if that guy, because remember, there's aliens in the page before. So I don't know if her roommate, was the roommate an alien that she blew up? Um, why is she okay with that? Because he really spontaneously combusted. And you're right, that is cake. Yeah. And see, I was taking it that the the roommate was an alien as well. Okay. And I kind of was theorizing, thinking that maybe that's why he exploded. Because even, you know, um, what's her name? Terry. Yeah, Terry didn't know why he exploded. And Casey didn't know why he exploded. She's like, wow, that's never happened before. Well, he's, you know, not actually a person. There's something. He was some type of manifestation who probably was sent to this universe to keep an eye on Casey for whatever reason. You know, it's part of, it's going to be part of the grand story, uh, the, the grandioso story that plays out. And there, there's so many just... I walked away from this with so many unanswered questions like who's the dead lion with all the light arrows in him? Who is the guy that, you know, Danny the Brick 
kills, you know, but, you know, and where is that? And, you know, and <laughs> next issue, quarter in the couch, Cliff goes cosmic. Okay, sure, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in, let's rock. <laughs> I wouldn't want every title like this. No. Um, but I do like it in my library because it's unusual. And I like this kind of unusual. This is really working for me because it's just enough outside of the whole thing that I, I'm, I'm very curious about it. I'm going to be very curious to see how this line goes because they're taking like Shade the Changing Man was a book that I really enjoyed. They're making Shade the Changing Girl, which is like the backup on this one. I'm excited to see that title. Uh, they're really doing a great job of saying, you know, sometimes you don't have to force these titles into current continuity. Um, they they may be part of a continuity of their own. Some of these might cross over with each other. Some of them may be connected to the current universe. I'm fine if they do that. I like that they're not forcing that to happen, though. Um, this is, to me, a lot of what I've always liked about Vertigo. You know, these these books aren't afraid to just kind of embrace its concept and tell great stories. And I don't know. I hope this line really... I, if this book's an indication of the kind of creativity we're going to get out of this line, they're being very smart because this is not like anything else in my reading right now. And that part I'm liking. Yeah. Shade, the LSD trip is kind of in, going to be interesting as well. <laughs> Once again, I'm glad this was the backup. They gave you the special sneak preview of shade, the changing girl, mm -hmm. but I was sitting there. Once again, I went from the one story going, what the heck happened to this is a living LSD trip. All right, <laughs> let's rock it. You know, I had White Rabbit going through my head. This was that was the song playing in my head as I'm, you know, reading this, man. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm all in. And, and the funny thing is, I read this issue after a really, really bad day at work. You know, so this thing came in at the absolute perfect time because there was no there was nothing serious. There was nothing crazy. You know, it was just this. It was an acid trip, and I'm like, all right, let's exp let's expand the mind, man. I, again, I want to read uh, Shade. I want to see where this goes because Shade, the Changing Man. I don't think I've ever. I think I picked up. Um, a trade of him one time, but I don't know if I actually read it or he, he was one of those characters that I kind of vaguely have some recollection of him, but I couldn't tell you his name, his powers or anything about him. But I do remember this trippy look to the book. So I'm like, okay, let's rock it. This one, you know what? Here's what worked for this one for me. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this point. Because you kind of touched on this. You said you were having a bad day. Like, lately, here's the thing. I'm trying to sell two houses still. Um, I'm in my brand new home that I'm loving, but I'm trying to sell two houses still. One of them is my father's home. We looks like we got buyers for both, but waiting for those to close. And until they close, you're not done. I mean, you know, so um, I don't have loan commitment for either of them right now. So I got a lot of stress going on. Plus, I'm taking classes for my principal licensure and my job. So a lot of stress going on in my life right now. Um, my wife and I are both running around like chickens with our head cut off. So to your point, you know, you come home on those days and for, you know, I've got like the best neighbors in the world right now, having a good time with them. Uh, my neighborhood's like real upbeat, you know, it's fun to drive down the street and even fun to drive to work from here. Um, so we, we had a, there was a block party this weekend and, you know, I don't know anybody here, you know, except, you know, I've, I've met some very kind neighbors, but I don't really know anybody well yet. And it was kind of nice to kind of go to a block party and just kind of see, okay, this is the place I live. And people here are in general pretty cool. And this is, you know, kind of a fun thing to do. I read this book on a particularly rough week. And there's a lot going on at my work. We're doing a lot of software transition. Um, we're going to something called Infinite Campus for grading. Um, I've got a brand new network we're putting in in my district that, you know, the project kind of lies on me. Um, we did a transition to a new version of Moodle for our science department, which is another software transition. And that's with an outside source, and that's been a source of stress for some of our teachers. So it's been a lot of these things are going on, and, and like I want to wrap them up. So you come home, and you want to like vent and just kind of chill out. You read this book. Here's what worked about it. Sometimes these books get really heady, and they forget to have fun. And when they do that, what ends up happening is they're so heady that there's what are you getting attached to? The characters aren't really likable because of the fact that it's too heady. You know, they're like too dry, if I'm making any sense. So it's hard to get attached and really enjoy the book. 
so you can trudge through some of those and they wind up being really good reads because when you eventually understand what's happening, the concept is enough that you're like, wow, all right, this is pretty deep. It clicks for me now. I want to follow it further. This was so much of a joy because of the fact that right away out of the gate, I thought Casey was cool. I really liked her as a character. I liked her relationship with Sam. I liked the interaction. Everything we got before the exploding burrito was <laughs> hanging out with these two people in a way that they felt like friends of mine that I know. And that was very smart as a writing choice. Because when you get into the weird stuff after that, you already like the characters. And I don't know if you had that experience. Did you, do you like Casey? Do you like her as a character? I mean, is this a character that you find interesting? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. You know, it was, again, it was one of those kind of, you know, I want to know who she is, what she's about. Mm-hmm. And I like the, I like the dynamic duo kind of between the two of them. I hope he doesn't explode. I hope nothing freaky happens to him. I'd like to, I'm hoping he stays quasi normal, you know, but you can't really have completely normal in a Doom Patrol story. But I'd like to see him kind of not be on the Doom Patrol, but be her human connection. But I got this bad feeling on him that something's going to happen to him. Not sure what, but something. Let them be cake. (laughs) (laughs) Exploding cake. (laughs) Comic books are fun. (laughs) That was was really great. I'm glad we got to talk about that one. There they are, all alone, except for that old character. Hey, Sean and Jim. This is Joseph Luciano, a.k.a. Legion Star, although I go by Hungry Ghost now. Um, just wanted to congratulate you guys on 10 years. Uh, it's been a long road. I've been listening from the beginning. Had a little lapse in there, but I've actually caught back up and I started from the beginning again. And now I'm at episode 203. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that I agree with you where, well, not that I agree with you, but I was one of those people that was turned off a little bit by the new 52, although I did buy it. But I always felt that there was something missing, uh, namely a JSA and Legion uh superhero books but besides that there was just something that it wasn't familiar to me where i had started dc again at one year later which is around the time you guys started your podcast and i just felt that uh, there was something unfamiliar there wasn't a uh, it didn't seem as friendly as inviting as dc was when i first when i started again after my old last 10 years ago and I just wanted to say that the, uh, what is it called, all oh, rebirth actually it's reignited that within me where uh, it feels like the old DC, the DC of old uh, that I was excited about, that I was excited to read every week and I'm you know, just looking forward to the future. And uh, Jeff Johns is the mad genius who I will continue to grab anything that he touches. And once again, congratulations on 10 years and I'll keep listening. I just reconnected with Joseph recently on Facebook. Joseph made shirts for us for um, for one of the cons. It was very, very kind of him to do. He um, he is very artistic and ended up coming up with these really cool Raging Bullets shirts. It was one of the New York cons that we were at. And uh, I really appreciated that. Uh, this is I'm so glad that he called in because this is exactly what I was wanting to hear from people. It's, you know, did you, were you lapsed? Did this draw you back? What what was it that drew you back to it? I agree with a lot of what he's saying here. And I honestly, I'm saying this as somebody who's loved the New 52 all along. But Rebirth Now is something, as I'm reading these titles, there's a different level of excitement. And I mean, it's very clear to me. Um, this episode, it's very clear to me as I'm recording. Yeah. My excitement is definitely different than other episodes we've done where I've really enjoyed what we were talking about and what was going on in the books. But there is something familiar in what he's talking about, where there is that sense of those unique things that make DC just really fun and exciting. There's a hope that's there with these characters. Um, I do feel like the titles are uplifting while at the same time just being being just as challenging to my intellect, um, delivering some really great stories, great twists and turns. Everything that I love about comics in general are here, but there is that piece that he's right, that was missing, that's back, and I, it, I feel it now. Whereas I, I wouldn't have said that there was anything missing when I was reading The New 52 because I wasn't having that experience. But now that I'm reading this, I'm like, oh yeah, there's there's some things back that I didn't realize I was missing that I really am. I, I'm with him. I would love to see a JSA title, love to see a Legion title. Um, I, I, what I want them to do, though, is to release them judiciously, 
when they have the kind of caliber of creative teams that they have right now. And when I say caliber, it's creative teams that really have these kind of stories in mind, where they have a way of making the Legion feel very contemporary, very now, but all the right elements that make the Legion cool back in again. So that way that classic Legion fan who's loved every single Legion issue has it back. JSA, I want the things uh, that made me so excited to read JSA. Uh, I want there to be the classic characters that we all know and love. But also, one of the things Jeff Johns did really well in his run, he had a great sense of introducing new characters that make you appreciate the legacy of the older characters. That's where Stargirl came from. That's where Mr. Terrific came from. Um, you want to put those type of characters in that again. And I want to see that kind of thing happen again, those special things happen with those books. So that part's interesting. Is there anything, Jim, you know, it's funny, he's bringing up an interesting point with those. Is there something missing right now that you would like to have back and rebirthed, you know, like a new reawakening of this <laughs> well it's funny because i I wouldn't say anything missing mm-hmm. because i'm getting a i'm loving what i'm getting so you sure. can't i don't want to use the word missing but there something that i would love to have back is um legion i would love to have legion a superhero story come back again and it's funny because i was you i was not a long term but just the, the concept of Rebirth, the concept of the Legion of Superheroes, just, you know, as excited as I am for stuff going on in, you know, in the Superman titles and the Bat titles, I'd love to see somebody who was passionate and who truly wanted to tell a great Legion of Superheroes story, wanted to bring back the Legion. You know, we are Legion. I want to see that come back. I want to see that energy, that same fire that we're getting in the current DCU. I want to have that, you know, in the future or them in the present, or maybe they're going to be this final linchpin to figuring out the great, you know, the great mystery of who what, and what happened to them. You know, I'd love to see them somehow get connected to this because in that, that one shot, they did introduce the fact that there is going to be Legion and they talked about it at different cons where they said, Hey, the Legion of superheroes are going to be around. You're going to see them again. You know, so they have said they're coming, but we just don't know when they're coming or how they're going to be used or who's going to be writing them. So it's, that is one I am definitely looking forward to. I'd love to see if they know that time has been messed with that. Everything's, you know, how does that work for them? Yeah, yeah, you know, and you know another another group. Obviously, I'd love to see come back is the six. Oh yeah, yeah. I I think that's always a thing on my list of. I always wish we would get a Secret Six title back, just because you know the Secret Six is awesome. You well, know, it's a great t- head, it's a great title yeah. that launched at the wrong time. Yeah, um, it, it should have been a part of Rebirth. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and that's that's part of the thing with that one. Um, I I. I it's sad because I don't know. I never follow the sales numbers, and I don't know what the sales numbers were like on that one. But I loved every minute of that book, and was it was really getting interesting. And then it was canceled. And I get it. It was because you know they're reworking the line and all that. So I understand why they did what they did. It's just the, the time the timing of the launch was. Unf- I think that's really an example of a great title that was launched at an unfortunate time. Yeah. And I would have loved to have seen it a part of this event because I think it would have, I think it would have really would have done something as a part of all this. Well, you think about the six if they were all because obviously they would have been affected by the memory. Sure. You know, what happens when they start getting their memory back? Because if they start figuring out things, you know, let the world <laughs> tremble and shake because with <laughs> them, you know, they'll go after the big bad. They'll go one on one and not care because that's who they are. That's that's their style. I'd love to see them start having an awakening, especially someone like Ragdoll. <laughs> yeah. Imagine he's the only one who remembers the old universe. You know, and of course, no one believes him because it's him. Mhm. <laughs> Such a great thing. It, honestly, there would have been so much to do with that book. I hope that they do consider launching it again at some point. I really do because I think it was a great concept. And I give him credit for launching it twice. Um, I just, I really would like to see it launched again because I just think it's a great title. So we'll see, we'll see what happens with that one. I, I'm with you though. Like right now, I, they're batting really high for me. So you're right. Missing is probably not the right word. It's more what titles would you like to see them do something yeah. with Rebirth? And that those, those would be a couple I would like to see something with. 
How you doing, Sean? Again, Mr. Russell, again, just to want to add on to my last little comments. DC announced three weeks ago that they are bringing back the Milestone Universe into back into their into publication. We'll not be doing a lot of monthly books, but they'll be doing specials in a couple mini seasons. Just wanted to get that out to the fans. That was a fan of their last Milestone books that was out over 20-something years ago. And hopefully... The way you guys read, you guys will put all types of characters. That's why I love this podcast. You guys love just comic books, period. You didn't, you don't care about if the characters gay, black, white. You just love comic books, and that's why your podcast is so good because you don't say a book is lame before you even open up the cover. But just want to mention that if you didn't know that the Milestone Universe is coming back, so more money for me to spend, and thank you for this podcast again. You have a pleasant day. How you doing, Sean and Jim? Uh, here to give you my review of the Suicide Squad movie. I don't know what's going on in the world of DC comic movies, but this movie was fantastic. I don't know what these people are watching. I don't know what's going on. So I've resigned myself. I'm not reading any more reviews for a DC comic book movie. And this is for all time because the vitriol and hate for this movie is totally pointless. I don't know what they want out of DC. It's like they can't get anything right. So I'm done. I enjoyed the movie. The movie was great for me. Even the writer of the 66th issue of the Suicide Squad movie said it was great. So John Ostinger said the movie is good. Who is anybody to criticize the movie? And I know everybody got their opinion, but I'm just going to say it. They're wrong. Last episode, you was asking me how do I store all my books. Well, I've had a storage room in Minneapolis that's a six by eight for over 20 years. And they, from top to bottom, stacked in long boxes. I have about 60 long boxes. I have a steamer trunk with about 5,000 books in it. I have various milk jug crates full of comics, boxes, and all types of various things like that. And I also keep, I always kept a ledger with the books written in ink and pencil rock and erase. But I'm going to do it the the gym segment way. I'm going to go to a Dewey Decimo system, and I've just been hearing you all rage about these draw boxes because I'm at episode 165 on your podcast. So I've been hearing you guys rage about these uh, draw boxes, and uh, I'm going to need 123 of these things so to fit 29,000 books. And so I'll be getting five of those things a month, so I have 120 three of these boxes, and then I'll start reshuffling the books in those boxes and so I can get easy access to these books. But I um, wanted to just tell you about the rebirth. The rebirth is perfect. I've proposed to DC Comics again. I'm never leaving the company again. This is what I've been wanting for DC, the legacy back. Now, all I need is a Justice Society book and a Legion of Superhero book, and my comic book reading would be perfect. You two gentlemen have a keep on podcasting, and until Arm um, Fall Off Boy, Radiation Roy, and Kite Man join the Justice League of America, make mine raging bullets. And you guys have a pleasant day. Love the show. Make mine raging bullets. I love that. Um, it's funny. Some of the things he was talking about, um, there's so many things I want to discuss that he was talking about in particular, um, including his storage and things like that. But um, taking a leap back uh, to some of the things like Suicide Squad, I, I'm with him. I don't know what people are looking for. I. I do respect people's rights to their opinion. I, I'll argue my right to mine, and I'll argue my opinion. Um, I do it, obviously, a lot on this show. You and I have sometimes some of the most ridiculous arguments over the things I'll take a stand on. But that's part of the fun of enjoying something. He's right about certain things. When he was talking about, like, Milestone, for example, and talking about one of the things we do on the show is we don't condemn a book before opening it. And I think there is a point to that. Um I don't feel this overwhelming need when I see a concept being released that a company's trying, whether it's Marvel, DC, and Independent, whatever, to say it's awful. It, I can tell pretty quickly if something's not for me, but I don't feel this need to mean that to like go on the internet and say, "Man, this is horrible," or do a podcast episode saying what were they thinking. I'll give my re- initial reactions, but we always give something a chance. And here's the funny part: on this show, we have a history of. The only things we've ever talked about coming up are things we actually intend to read to see what they're going to be like. So let's go back to when the New 52 was kicking off, right? And we saw the image of Superman in his uh, suit. There was the armored suit. I was not a fan. And I said, I have some trepidation about that suit, but I'm going to give it a shot. And wound up loving the story behind it. 
And it took me a while, though, to get used to it. That's a great example of where you got to read something in practice to decide whether or not it's a thing for you. And I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that we have a show where we do that. It's not something that you and I like force ourselves to do. We just kind of organically do that. But I think it's really important nowadays to, because so many things are trashed because people haven't seen them and they just, they saw a trailer, they read a couple preview pages and they'll go on and, and just like totally destroy it. And then you'll see that the thing either, if it's a comic, it's canceled. If it's a movie, it just does horrid at the box office. And a lot of times when I end up seeing or reading those things, I'm like, you know, that was actually pretty good. And I feel bad for it because it's something that maybe could have led to sequels or led to an audience and never quite found its audience base because of the fact that it was trashed by people who never even bothered to give it a shot. Um, that bugs me. It, that, that's, if there's one thing that bugs me, it's that. It's seeing something destroyed that somebody hasn't seen. I've got a lot more respect for somebody who I loved a movie, they hated a movie, but they saw it. Well, okay, we can have an actual honest conversation around that and and agree to disagree and respect each other at the end. Um, That I can always work with. I don't when there's people who haven't actually experienced something. That's different. There's a distinctive difference between the two. He talked about Milestone and those characters and, and kind of gave us a really nice compliment, which I really appreciated. Um, the fact that we don't care uh, about the character's background or you know preferences or things like that, I find that I don't. I mean, Doom Patrol is a great example of that, where it's like I don't know. I want characters. If I'm going to read a new character or a different character, I want it to be a character that is going to give me something that I'm not getting from another title. So when like I hear that Milestone, there's going to be some Milestone miniseries that excites me because it's different. So I'm going to be getting a different sort of reading experience. Um, You know, when characters have a different sexual preference or something like that, and it's not done for the sake of doing it. It's actually something that's done for the sake of embracing it and telling a unique and interesting story. Batwoman's a great example of that. Um, I think one of of the best characters to come out where they really, from the ground up, crafted this character to be somebody. It's It's a lesbian character who is... That's not her whole story. That's part of who she is. And I think that's what makes her so interesting is because she's written like a very real person going through that. And I find it interesting. Yeah. See, and I'm glad you threw out the Batwoman story because for me, that character, it it was, you know, she's, she's, you know, she's a gay, but she's not the gay superhero. She's a superhero who happens to be gay. And I love the fact that's what her thing is. Same thing like with Midnighter. That's not what he is he yes he is that but that's not the governing factor of his character and the reason behind his character he's a cool character because he's a really cool character he almost also happens to be gay but that's cool because it's just you know it's just a piece and a part of him but it's not the definition of him and and like with her when they brought it out when they when she came out and when they you know told her backstory and everything that happened with her with you know being the cadet and being called on the the honor code and i love i still to this day love the fact that you know when she was called to task when they said hey are you gay and it was i love the fact that she verified was somebody else going to get in trouble if she said yes you know, and as soon as they said she was the only one who was being accused, she knew her girlfriend or partner or, or you know lover or whatever you want to call her was in the clear. She knew, okay, now it's on my honor. It's not about you know because if she would have she would have protected the other person if she needed to, but now it was just her. It was all on her. So she's like, I will not lie, cheat, or steal, nor will I tolerate anyone who does. That right there is the definition of the honor code. And I love the fact that they pulled that in for her. And that's why she's out. And then, you know, everything that just transpired, the downward spiral, her return to reclaim part of who she is, you know, and just the development of Batwoman, why it came to be, who she is. And it was just everything building from that moment where she had that complete fall. You know, for her rebuilding herself up. And it's one of those things that really made me appreciate and like the character because she had this powerful backstory. 
She didn't witness her parents getting murdered like Bruce did, but she had an equally powerful, significant event in her life that helped form who she is and why she became Batwoman. And I love that about her. And that's something I will always, I, she's one of those characters I will 100% defend just because of the strength of character. And Midnighter is another character I'll 100% defend just because he is such an awesome character that I'm like, you know what? I don't care. This is a great character. And especially you put him in the hands of someone who knows how to write him. Oh, my God. Like yeah. those, the bits between him and Dick Grayson throughout. Anytime you bring those two together, especially during the Grayson run, that was some great Midnighter stories. I was absolutely going, this is awesome. You know, I'm going to correct something you said. And please tell me if you think I'm right on this one. Because I, I want to kind of tweak something that you said that I think um, – it's it's just it was making me think of something. You said that it doesn't define them. I, I would disagree slightly and say it's part of what defines them, but it doesn't diminish them. And I think that's the unique thing about them. I think you know there's pieces, parts of all of us that are have to do with interests, preferences that are part of our makeup, right? Um, a lot of times when you write a character who is a little different. They use that to diminish those characters. You know, there's, that's, this is the struggle that they're overcoming. I really like that with Midnighter and Batwoman, I find it refreshing these characters aren't diminished by their preferences. If anything, they're two of the most badass characters in the universe. And I, I really like that twist with them. Um, it makes when they do have a love life and relationships and, and those type of things far more interesting because of the fact that they are so tough in who they are and it's very genuine and I, I love that nothing is written awkward about those characters uh, and, and that's something so I don't know if, if you think I'm right in how I'm saying that or, or maybe you have a, a different take in how you're thinking on that I'm, I'm curious about it we're, we're saying the same thing but differently and mm -hmm. we're using different phraseology because mm -hmm. in my head when I'm saying they're not defined by that I'm saying that that's not the sole functionality of who they are agreed you know that's what I say not defined by that's what I'm saying I'm not saying it doesn't go into there because I just went into a whole spiel about how part of Batgirl's origin was the fact that she was gay that she had to deal with that that she overcame that she had this quote unquote honor you know that she you know that she had a you know um, when you get dishonorably discharged from the West from West Point that's a huge blow to your honor but for her it was about maintaining her honor Honor. She could not lie. She could not, you know, she had to be up. She had to tell the truth. She had to be, declare who she is. And that was the whole thing. So when I say it doesn't define them, I'm saying that's not something that it's, you know, the sole factor of who they are. It, it, there's so there's the character is a hero. First and foremost, the character is a badass. First and foremost, <laughs> that is what I talk about when I'm saying they're not defined by being gay. Yes, being gay is a part of who they are, especially with Batwoman. That is a huge part of her backstory. You know, everything that transpired, everything that happened, everything going on in her current life, just part of the reason she became Batwoman was because of, you know, the fact that she got, um, she was, you know, just, you know, you know, dishonorable discharge is a huge thing to bear, especially if you come from a rigorous military family like that. Because that's, you know, nowadays we don't have to deal with that. Nowadays it's okay. But back when this character was created, back when everything was going on, you know, if you were, you know, if you were, you know, gay or, you know, lesbian and you're in the military, that's a dishonorable discharge. And that's huge. And that's, you know, that's a major just, you know, you know, a blotch to somebody, especially if they come from this long military line where their whole life has been defined based on one factor that I am a soldier. And that was her de definition. That's who she was. And she lost all that and she just knocked, knocked her out. But, you know, like any good fighter, you get knocked down, but you get back up and you get back into the fight. And that's, you know, part of the neat, you know, that's part of the, you know, just the badass that is Batwoman. I agree. Absolutely. <laughs> We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about his storage. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say drawer boxes. Uh, they, they actually sponsored us for, I think, an episode or two years ago. Um, but they're no longer sponsored. They haven't been for quite some time. And uh, so I'm not saying this with them as a sponsor. They are the most brilliant creation 
in a while for comics, I think. They, they're constructed in such a way where they have this slide-out drawer, and you put your comics in them just like you would a long box. If you haven't seen them before, they really are like a drawer that you can easily access your comics. The cool thing is, though, the shell is a cardboard shell, but it's reinforced on the inside. You can stand on it. Um, it's that strong. And when I say you can stand it, you can stand on it without the drawer being inside there. Not that I'm saying you should go buy drawer boxes and like do a balancing act on them. It's just I'm talking about their durability, and that's how they've demoed them. Um, a Comic Geek Speak was actually the podcast I was listening to at the time where they had uh, done a big push for them. And after I had seen one of the drawer boxes in person, I couldn't wait to use one. And they are easily one of the cooler storage solutions because it is nice to be able to catalog your books however you'd like to and be able to access them via the drawer boxes. I think they're just a really neat solution. So uh, I, I can't believe how many he's got to get because <laughs> he's got an amazing <laughs> collection. That's that's really great, though, because over the years I've had to, unfortunately, purge. I actually had to purge some of my comics for this move because um, I have a lot of duplicates. You know, I've talked about over the years how I've amassed, you know, like we've rebought <laughs> comics. <laughs> so I, I started purging some just because of the fact that I had to sell the home that we were living in. And the space really, one of the reasons why we wanted to move, our space was getting a little too cluttered for both of us. We had a lot of things in crates that were stored in our basement, and some of them were things that you can't get rid of. So it was kind of therapeutic. I went through and I started purging duplicates of things and things I hadn't looked at in five years. I'm not talking about comics, just other you know, tchotchkes that we've kept over the years, and really got rid of a lot of stuff for the purpose of keeping only what was necessary so the house was less cluttered for the purpose of selling. And um, I, I have said over the years, I had to purge comics sometimes for the purpose of selling comics to pay for comics, you know, especially when I was in college and stuff where I didn't have any money, you know, it was, I wanted to keep reading. So I would sell some comics in order to continue reading because reading's always been the thing first for me. I do regret though, there's certain runs that I've gotten rid of over the years that I do regret getting rid of. And they're the ones that I'll go back and collect either in a hardcover collection or in singles. You know, and when I go to a con, specifically for the purpose of the reading of those again, and having uh, so I've I've pretty much so got my collection where I want it again, you know, where I've got at least single copies of everything, whether it's in a collected format or something like that. But I am in awe when you've got a guy like Russell who has such an amazing collection. That's got to be wonderful, and he he's like you. I mean, you're you guys have a pretty strong commitment to trying to come up with some form of organization to what you're dealing with. Because that's a lot of books he's trying to organize. You and your <laughs> are you no here's the thing. You've mentioned the Dewey Decimal system on the show for cataloging. How I know how you are, and I mean this as a compliment. You're a pretty organized fellow. And when things aren't organized and you can't find things quickly, you want to do something with them. I know that there's probably some serious humor in what you were talking about, but I think there's also a part of you that's coming up with a cataloging system for what you're doing. Are you really, what does that look like? Have you, have you been exploring this? I'm, I'm just very curious to how much reality there is okay. and how much, it, how much it's being Jim being silly. Okay. Part of the, uh, me talking about the Dewey decimal system is me joking around. Right. You know that that is that is a you know joke. But though the Dewey Decimal System, and actually all seriousness, could really work well for the the comic book collection because you think about how because they, the the decimal system is designed for cross references. So you could do title create. You could cross reference by creator. Oh. So you could actually do a search. You know, going let me see all the you know Jeff Johns books. Let me see all the books that you know Freddie was the artist on. Or and that's how the the system is designed. So it's not just a single refer. You know, single search. There's multiple different searches. You know, and that's just the basis of it. But to be honest, any database system that's out there you can have that search functionality you can kind of have that search creativity so i'm i am still trying to figure out how i'm going to catalog and organize because i definitely really do need to do that you know but it's right now life has been so crazy that i haven't had a chance to attack it and i think probably that's going to be my winter project because one of the things I do with the different projects is, especially with the comic books, I'll take them because I've, my living room in my house is bare bones empty. 
I still haven't figured out what I want to put in it. I've got a family room where I have my TV, my couch, my chair that I sit in to watch TV. I have all that stuff. But my living room is pretty much bare bones empty. So I'll actually take the comics and do stacks of the different comics in there to help the organization. So I'll pull them from the one room, stack them out, lay them out, and then try to figure out an organizational system. So Can this I- winter is going to be the organization of my comics. Do you have them all cataloged? No, that's the thing. I want. I got to figure out how I'm going to catalog these things I, because one, I want to get a value of them so I can add a rider to my home insurance in case mm-hmm. anything happens to my house. I can get the you know, the value of the comics. Can I give a suggestion? There is sure. a um, there's there's a program, and these aren't the only ones. And certainly, as listeners, um, feel free to either go to our Facebook group or to call into the show with your own suggestions of how you do this. Um, I've used both Comic Collector and Comic Base. Um, Comic Base is the one I've been using more recently, and I really like it, but um, it's not a anything against Comic Collector. I just kind of got into this one, and now I'm kind of committed. Um, it, it uses a barcode scanner. So it's a great way to go through your collection and zing, 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 and get them all into a database. And it it has... Updates, so you can you download the update of the most current books and everything. It has all of the things you were talking about, creator references, different things like that. So you can search for the different books that you have. It's it's kind of a neat way to catalog and organize them. Um, those are only two programs out there. I'm sure our listeners probably have more of them. Uh, I, and I do encourage people if you're cataloging your comics, how are you doing it, and like what do you like about the method that you're using? I think our listeners would find that interesting, because that's always the thing. You know, you want to know what books you have. It's a great way to find out what you need to fill in. You know, if you're like trying to complete runs, um, most of these programs offer some form of printout of missing issues, where you can pick a series and go, hey, from this series, what am I missing? And actually take that as a checklist when you go to a convention. So that's very cool if you like to go to conventions and book hop. And like, look around from uh, you know, in, anytime you go through those bargain bins, it's great when you start pulling up a run of a title that you need to fill in. <laughs> You've mentioned them before, and I keep thinking, I keep meaning to look them up and try to figure out and etc. Because I like the idea of the barcode, I like the scan. I think that'd be kind of a you know, it'd be easier for me. I think to just do, 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 you know, and you know, to actually, so I'm not. Spending time and trying to create a database. Why reinvent the wheel when it's already out there? There's a yearly cost to it, but the yearly cost provides the weekly updates. You know, because you want the weekly updates of all the current books with the creators and all, you know, the information that we're talking about here. So that's really what you're paying for. And then they'll have, feel like, version updates and things like that throughout the year. Um, So it's worth the yearly cost for it. Like I said, I've used Comic Base extensively. I've, I've tried Comic Collector too. I was already using Comic Base extensively when I tried Comic Collector, so I don't want anyone to think, you know, if you're a Comic Collector fan, that I'm saying, boy, that program was awful. I was already using Comic Base. Um, Comic Collector's great. From I used, I tried a demo of it just to get familiar with it, and I, I find that it's just as good of a program. Um, if anybody out there is using something though, or found something they really like, or even any of these two programs, you're maybe you're using Comic Collector and you want to shout it out um, and and talk about some of its features that you think are better. If you've used more than one, I'd love to hear how, what made you jump from one to the other. What what features were there? I just think I think those things are interesting, and I would really say that to anybody out there listening. Any of the topics we talk about on the show, I always welcome listener follow-up or, or maybe to take it one step further than we did because maybe you have some ideas to share that are interesting. You know, I, I, Both Russell and Joseph called in based on, on topics we brought up in the show and, and tried to add on to that conversation, and, and I think our show benefits when, when listeners do that. So I want to thank both Joseph and Russell for calling in. He is called Hawkman. His gauntlets possess awesome power. I want to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you part of the show, so please feel free to call in with your thoughts on this or any other episode. And don't feel like you're restricted to topics we just talk about on the show. There's a lot about DC that we don't ever get to on our episodes. And I love having people open up topics that we haven't talked about. So if there's something on your mind, feel free to call into the show. TV, media, games, 
um, any kind of comic line, feel free to shout them out, and I'd love to have that part of our podcast episodes. I want to remind everyone about RagingBullets.com. It's where we list our releases. When the show goes up, it goes to RagingBullets.com first. We pump that out to Twitter and to Facebook. Speaking of Facebook, there's a wonderful Facebook group community, and it's made up of just really terrific people. If you're not ever a, a member of a Facebook group community and maybe you find them invasive, remember that there's a lot of settings on there where you can change your preference on how you get information from that Facebook group to the point where you can actually have it give you no notifications if you prefer it that way. My point with all that is don't let that keep you away from talking to the great people there. And I love that community. Uh, it's made up of podcasters, bloggers, fans of comics, fans of media. Some people listen to this show. Some people have never listened to this show. They just joined the community. I actually like that the community has grown into its own thing beyond the podcast. So I just want to, once again, shout out the amazing people that are there. I think they represent what I love about comic fandom. They're people that just really love this medium and love to talk about it and love to share that ideas with others. And I just love that it's spawned into something like that. And it says a lot about the quality of the people over there. We are on Google+. Plus. Um, I also have a PlayStation Network account. Feel free to join me over on that one. So uh, we just love interacting with all of you. So uh, thank you very much for supporting our show. Jim, we are sponsored once again by DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Can you tell us what's going on over at DCBS? Of course, bundles, bundles, bundles. They're continuing their support of uh, Rebirth with multiple bundle packs at 50% off, including including a Vertigo pack, you know, bundle for 50% off and a Young Animals bundle at 50% off, as well as a variant cover title uh, bundle for 45% off. But also we've got a really cool uh, Catwoman story, Catwoman Election Night. It's a includes a backup story of Beth Ross uh, Prez from the uh, previous miniseries. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's coming out, actually comes out right around the election time. So I think it's kind of an appropriate thing. 40% off, only two ninety nine. I do want to remind everyone that DCB Service is a digital partner. So whether you do Comixology or My Digital Comics, go to their website, make sure you link those accounts to your DCB Service account, and do your shopping through their portal. It doesn't cost you anything more, but every time you shop through their portal, 5% of those purchases go towards your DCB Service order. And it's a great way to get yourself some more money. It supports our sponsor for purchases you're already making. Over at InStockTrades.com, I love the latest releases, checking to see what's out there, because I miss a lot of titles. You know, Obviously, we're a DC-focused podcast, so I will focus on that when I do my initial ordering. I'm seeing over there, they got like the pre-code EC classics, those old comics. They've got Journey into Fear. They've got weird fantasy archives. The Journey into Fear is 25% off, only $44.99. The EC Archives Weird Fantasy Hardcover Volume 2 is 45% off, only $27.49. They also have the Green Lantern Trade Paperback Renegade Volume 7, 42% off, only $10.43. And the Justice League 3001 Trade Paperback Volume 2, 42% off, only $8.69. A lot of great comics that are being released over there, but I love those classics and um, those being collected into uh, these really cool hardcovers. Um, I'm a big fan of horror comics, and I just wanted to shout them out just because it's it's kind of the weird, quirky thing that you can find when you're browsing through DCB <laughs> Service and InStockTrades.com. You'll see re-releases of just great material that you may have missed previously. And so feel free to browse around and look and see what you may have missed. You, you'll find some really cool comics to read. And that's part of the fun of this medium is just how diverse it is. So I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Jim, our next episode... We should probably talk about some comics because you know what we got coming. So. You know what we got com coming soon that we're going to want to talk about too is the kickoff of the seasons of the television shows. Yeah, I know, I know <laughs> Gotham's already running, but we got the other ones coming as well. So we're going to have to have an episode where we start talking about the current shows and what's going on with them. So we'll we'll do comics next, and then start talking about TV shows. I think sounds good. All right, we will see everyone next week. Bye. On November 13th, Sean Whalen was asked to stop constantly talking about comic books. That request came from his wife. Deep down, he knew she was right, but he also knew that someday he would find someone that would talk to him. With nowhere else to go, he appeared at the home of his childhood friend, Jim Segulin. Sometime earlier, Segulin's boss had requested that he shut up about his comic books and never speak of them again. Can two grown men put out a DC Comics podcast without driving each other crazy? 
It's Raging Bullets, the DC Comics Fan Podcast. With Sean Whalen as Dr. Norge. And Jim Segulin as the Sensei of the Whatnot and the Duke of You Know. It's a spoiler podcast, so they will go in depth into the plot line, story twists, and whatnot of the comics they are reviewing. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you may better enjoy the show. 